Good afternoon, everyone. I can tell from the weird echo that my microphone is at least working, so that's a good start. I'm hoping that you are all here to hear about some experiences in breaking out of CICD pipelines. Uh, I'm going to start off with the mandatory. Who here has used some form of CI before? Let's get some audience participation. There's some hands. I can't really see that many because my glasses are filthy and these lights are really bright. Um, <laughs> Who has broken out of CI pipelines? Anyone done that sort of thing? We're getting some yeses. That'll do. Good enough for me. Quick introduction. I'm Ian. I am the containerization practice lead at NCC Group. I've been with the company for about six years, and I've spent most of that time breaking out of containers or cloudy environments, and most recently, pipelines. Hi, everyone. My name is Victor, and I'm a Jenkins security MVP and also a cloud research group leader and I have uh, seven years of experience. So just to make sure we're all on the same page here, we'll throw some terminology around first of all. Um, we're talking about CI and CD. CI is continuous integration. So when your devs are running some code, writing some code, make some commits, goes into something like GitHub or GitLab or whatever your version control of choice is. And continuous integration generally for our purposes is running things like unit testing or security static analysis against the code. And then CD, depending on which acronym book you've swallowed lately, is continuous deployment, continuous development. Um, this is the part where a service automatically picks up the code that you've written or the, the compiled version and then fires that off into your production environment to actually run where users can hit it. A pipeline basically is a bunch of tasks sequentially programmed to run one after another. Um, a secret, we're going to talk about secrets quite a lot. This is basically anything you don't want to be public. So API keys, passwords, um, I don't know, SSH keys, something along those lines. Anything you wouldn't want the wider internet to have access to. An RCE, remote code execution, basically, can I get some code to run on your machine? So now that we know the words, let's have a graph. Pipeline would generally look something like this. So you've got your developer. Um, developers are happily writing code. The theory behind CICD is it accelerates your developers. So everyone's working on a central code base. The code's being committed in. And then whenever something happens on code or on a schedule, uh, something is triggered. Now that something could be a commit. It could be a merge request. Basically anything that makes a change to the the environment. Could also just be a schedule like rebuild this once a month. And at that point, you'll generally see some testing happen, some deployment happen. You might create some artifacts like a uh, static analysis report to be ingested into some form of ticketing system. You might have uh, some compiled binaries being spat out, some Docker containers being built. And then the next steps in some environments, most of the time, will pick up those artifacts and then launch them off to run somewhere. That somewhere could be either on-prem or um, in the cloud, could be something serverless. Basically, this is where the code ultimately ends up running. And this pipeline can be very complex, and you can include a lot of tools, so even like hundreds of tools. And people created a periodic representation of these tools that you can see in the slides. Thank you. So <clears throat> what will the attacker uh, see when, when he, uh, they look at your uh, CI-CD pipeline? So they will see that some code goes in and then apps come out, or even uh, an application got uh, deployed in a production environment or a test environment. Uh, so they don't really have to do too much because they just add some codes, and then they will have access to uh, a different environment or, or network or something else. So these pipelines have uh, access to multiple networks and uh, multiple um, environments as well. So starting from test environment, uh, pre-production environment, production environment, but also it can be on-prem or cloud as well. Uh, also, these uh, pipelines and the supporting uh, infrastructure stores uh, credentials that uh, are used uh, throughout the steps. But also, they pull uh, third party or internal dependencies as well, like Docker images or uh, JavaScript uh, package. But they also uh, push and upload the final artifact or the final uh, program, or they will just deploy uh, in a cloud environment uh, web application. 
but they also can use it and see it as a free resource. So if they want to use it as a crypto mining uh, application and uh, mine some crypto, then they can do it as well. So there's a bit of background of what CI and CD is and does. Generally, we're seeing it being adopted to speed up developers, make them run a bit faster because devs like to go fast. Over the last few years, we've uh, had a few engagements. We've had more and more customers asking us to have a look at some CI deployments, and we've started to see some fairly interesting breakouts. Um, we're not going to be dropping any O-days at the moment, but what we are going to do is show some fairly high impact times where the uh, security principles were not applied as well as they could have been to some fairly interesting effects. So the first engagement that we want to talk about was a customer who approached us and said, hey, we've got a fairly locked down pipeline. We're quite happy with this. Um, can you come in? We'll give you developer access. We'll just give you credentials. Let's see what you can do as a normal developer, not an admin user or anything like that. So we come in, we've got access to a single Bitbucket repo, and it was hosting an Apache Maven project, so we had some Java. Um, one of the things that we were able to modify with this access was the dependencies that were required for the application to build successfully. We uh, did something extremely clever, which was, hey, let's just specify one of our own dependencies instead of the internal ones that are meant to be used. So we hosted our uh, malicious dependency on attacker.com, told the uh, build pipeline, hey, when you build this code, go and retrieve all the dependencies from your dependency file. Quite happily, it reached out to us and grabbed our payload, which was a meterpreter reverse shell. No fancy AV bypasses or anything here. We literally went, Metasploit, give me a payload, reverse shell, happy days. So as soon as the pipeline started running, it reached out to our server, grabbed our dependency, loaded that in, and then went, hey, as part of this program, I need to reach out and just get a shell back on this, this um, target that I've been told about. We were given access effectively through this to a Jenkins runner. We didn't know at the start that this was Jenkins. We uh, found out fairly quickly. And this uh, runner had a fairly limited environment, so there wasn't too much in the, the runner's file system, which was good for us because it made our recon really easy. Basically, we ran LS, LAR, got a dump of absolutely everything, looked for anything juicy. And one of the things we, one of the things we found in the kind of bowels of the file system was uh, an SSH private key. We have no idea why that was there. Turns out later on, the customer didn't really know why that was there either. So we've got a private key, and we've got network access. We did a little bit of Nmap, found port 22 listening everywhere. Uh, so we've now got keys, we've got SSH access. As a wise snowman once said, put them together, it just makes sense. We had SSH access into some other servers. And again, at the time, we didn't really know what the other servers were. We were just scanning around and trying keys. Turns out those were the Jenkins control nodes. Uh, so Jenkins has a hierarchy of worker nodes and control nodes. Control nodes tend to hold the more juicy secrets. And what we were able to get in this case was all of the secrets for all of the projects that were running in Jenkins, including a kubeconfig file. For those of you not familiar with Kubernetes, that's basically an authentication file. And in this case, it turns out that we had uh, full access to deploy anything we liked into the customer's production workload. Now, this was meant to be there because the pipeline had to deploy uh, workloads. That was what it was written for. But as a developer, I wasn't meant to be able to get direct access. We could. We could deploy any workloads we wanted. And because there was no admission control or anything at this point, we were able to basically compromise the entire production cluster. Now, in the interest of defending against this, we've got some lessons learned. Hopefully, these are relatively apparent, the first one being building credential hygiene. As I say, we didn't know, and the customer didn't know why that SSH key was there. There was no legitimate reason for it to be there, so it probably shouldn't have been. Without that, we'd have had a really hard time getting around the environment, getting around the estate. Similarly, network filtering, um, their build environment was able to reach out to the internet to grab our malicious dependency, and it was able to reach out to the Jenkins, the other nodes, to SSH around. A little bit of firewall ruling would have probably stopped this attack quite quickly. And again, dependency validation. Had the customer only allowed pulling from internal uh, repositories, then we probably wouldn't have been able to pull down our external malicious dependency. I had also a similar assessment uh, where uh, GitHub was uh, used, but uh, it was used as an identity provider. So in this case, um, in Jenkins, they used a dedicated plugin. It, the name is uh, GitHub Authentication Plugin. 
and I will uh, show a demo video. We're not brave enough to try, the li try a live demo, don't worry. Been burned by that one too many times before. So I call this uh, the confusing <coughs> uh, wording or plugin because uh, this plugin, as you can see here uh, at the moment, I use a uh, Vegas dog user who is in the NCC pen test demo organization. And uh, when you use this plugin and you use the option that uh, grant read permission to all authenticated users, uh, you can see it's uh, checked. It doesn't say is it related to Jenkins or is it related to GitHub. So unless you see or read the description and, and test, then you will find out. So here you can see my uh, user um, called VGASDAG. <coughs> uh, I will show that it's uh, in the NCC pen test organization and uh, that's the only member. Now because this option was enabled and the option says uh, it's related to GitHub. All I had to do was uh, create a GitHub account, and then I could log into the Jenkins instance, and I could see the build history, console output, and so on. So here you will see that uh, I opened the Jenkins, and it redirected me to the GitHub uh, login page. So I will use a separate account. Uh, the name is uh, Woodspeed, and a different email address. and. Uh, here you can see that it's only two users. It's not, uh, boot speed is not there. Uh, I will use my uh, MFA code. If I can. And then I will just enable that uh, it can access my uh, profile and so on. So once I enable it and logged in with my arbitrary account, uh, I logged in to Jenkins as well. And here you can see that uh, boot speed is not in the same organization but uh, registered as a uh, GitHub account. So what we recommend is read the description of the plugins or uh, whatever custom code you use and uh, test it, so validate it really does what it um, suggest. Uh, also use least privilege uh, principle with the role-based access control and uh, the separation of duties. So the next <coughs> example, uh, it's called the build output, because sometimes uh, even the CI CD pipelines helps us, so it will help us to uh, do something and, and reach something or uh, let us do easier things. It's not because uh, the company gave all the developers administrator accounts. I, I didn't choose uh, because of this. It's bad. Uh, but what I, why I choose this because they used infrastructure as a code, and they used Terraform, the tool itself. And they didn't use a dedicated plugin. Um, this is important because if you use Terraform, it will, uh, you can use uh, variables and you can print out uh, what has been created. And in this case, they also printed out an AWS API key as well. And because it's in the pipeline and directly used, um, in the console output and the build output, everything will be recorded. So you will see all the variables that has been, have been created, and uh, in this case also the AWS API key as well. So again, uh, you will see some patterns. So we also recommended here again the least privilege principle with role-based access control, separation of duties, but also uh, we recommend using dedicated plugins because the plugin developers know what are the sensitive data and uh, information, so they will know how to mask it and when to mask it. And most of the time we also see that uh, there was no monitoring or alerting enabled. So if someone changed the configuration, system configuration or a role has been changed, there was no alert or, or any uh, record of it. 
So these engagements don't always start off with quite as easy as, hey, we've given you dev access, please carry on and just uh, start from, uh, from a privileged position. Um, this, this next example was part of a red team engagement that we performed a while back where we were up against a relatively hard target, couldn't get in through our usual paths. But what we were able to do was fish a developer and get their credentials. And then we were able to log into their uh, cloud-based CI. So kind of similar to my previous story, we had developer access, even though in this case we weren't really meant to have it, but we did. Happy days. Um, so we had developer access, and we had access to a fairly wide range of repositories. Not all of these were hooked up to an automatic pipeline. And an important thing to note here is that the customer um, was doing some things fairly well. So we didn't have access as admin to absolutely everything. We had relatively restricted permissions on the repositories that we had access to. However, we were able to modify some of the pipelines. And one of the things that this customer was not doing was separating secrets out per, uh, per branches or anything like that. So as Victor just mentioned, it's possible to protect our secret. So whenever we tried to get secrets out of the pipeline, we just got the word redacted or the word masked or similar, which is not great because we can't really use that as a password. However, one of the things you could do, and I say bypass here, I use that term loosely, was run printenv and then just pipe that to base64, at which point the regex for is this an API key failed because it's just base64. So we then grabbed that data from the logs um, Base64 decoded it on our end. Anecdotally, one of the things I really like doing in these jobs when we don't really have direct access to logs is uh, to use something like Slack webhooks because organizations love to use GitOps and they love to have their pipeline ping developers on Slack whenever, the, um, whenever a build fails. But that means they've generally whitelisted api.slack.com, at which point you can just run printenv base64 that and pipe it to a webhook and then like, my Slack pings and says, hey, here's all the keys, which is quite fun. Even more fun if the customer has, um, has a big screen on the side of their monitoring center that shows all of these alerts, and then you can just start sending GIFs to their Slack webhooks. That's far too fun. It confuses them a lot. Uh, uh, yeah, there were some weird people were very confused when that started happening. Um, but yeah, basically this pipeline had domain admin access, because obviously it did. Why would it not? So fairly hard target, apart from the one pipeline, that ran everything as DA. So we found their limited Windows estate and we had admin. Uh, interestingly, with this job, the customer reached out to us and said, hey, by the way, just so you know, we got a load of alerts. We know you've got access to this pipeline. Uh, that's really uh, not good because you've crashed our pipeline and it's not running anymore. They didn't realize what the credentials were. So we thought we'd been burned and they'd rotate the credentials. Nope, they just left them there until the debrief at the end of the job. So again, um, I'm going to say the second point here first. This shouldn't need to be said in 2022. Don't run everything as domain admin, please. It's just not a good idea. Um, and also, restricting secrets to certain branches is probably a good idea. So as I say, this customer had protected branches. Not every developer could talk to the main branch and make changes um, because the, uh, it had the secrets been restricted to that branch, we wouldn't have been able to get access without compromising more accounts and doing more approval of requests. And again, in the spirit of doing weird attack chains and jobs that don't necessarily start out as CI, we were performing an internal infrastructure review and we found a web app that lit up like a Christmas tree. It was vulnerable to absolutely everything across the estate. Uh, so um, mainly server-side request forgery and local file inclusion vulnerabilities. We didn't really know what this app was, but we knew it looked interesting. And it turned out later that this was an app that had been was being tested, and they knew it was vulnerable, but it was running in the middle of the pipeline. So we didn't have access to the code. We didn't have access to the production running environment. But what we did have access to was an, an instance of the application running in the customer's development environment, and we knew nothing more about it at the time. But we started prodding around and doing some recon. Um, and what we found was that the application was running in Kubernetes. The customer was using that to power their build pipeline, which is fairly common. Um, Nice little tip if you ever want to find out if something's running in Kubernetes and you've got access to files. Catting ETC hosts, generally, if it's in Kubernetes, it has a nice line at the top that says this is managed by Kubernetes. Happy days. Um, so yeah, we, we managed to get a service account token as well. And that service account token could be used to authenticate the Kubernetes API. We started some further recon. We found out that we had various permissions. Um, and where this gets a little bit more bizarre and took some research was the customers are using 
um, an AWS managed cluster. And I should emphasize this is in no way a like, massive vulnerability or anything. They've just given permissions to a service account they maybe shouldn't have done because we were able to edit configuration maps. Basically, what we were able to do was add a new mapping to say this AWS account ID has these permissions inside the cluster. So we gave my AWS account cluster admin. And the API server was available over the internet. So at this point, I've got an AWS account. I've got a server. Um, we were able to basically do whatever we wanted on the cluster, which sounds really bad apart from this was only the dev cluster. This wasn't actually the production workloads. And obviously, our end game was can we get production data? So a little bit more research. Let's see what else is happening. With cluster admin, we could view all of the jobs across the whole cluster. That let us get all of the secrets for all of the jobs that weren't being managed through a dedicated secrets management solution. And that included further API keys to push images to ECR. Um, basically, one of the jobs was take this code, build it into a Docker image, publish that image. We couldn't find anything that said, I want to load that image into this cluster and actually run. So we weren't really sure what was happening. So we did a little bit more digging, found some documentation. And it turned out that this customer was using a pool based. CI in their final cluster, in their production workload. So instead of a service running outside the cluster with credentials saying, right, I want to push this into the cluster to run, there was something in the cluster waiting for changes to be made. The uh, cluster eventually realized that we'd published a new ECR image, went, oh, that looks shiny. I'll have that, please, and then uh, loaded up. And in the logs was a nice little NCC was here because we didn't want to do anything more disruptive. So. We didn't directly have the ability to push something in, but what we did have the ability to do was modify something that would automatically get pulled in, which had the same effect in the end. We had code running in production. And again, lessons learned. Let's keep these themes going. Hopefully, you're seeing the common patterns here by now. Um, least privilege are back, and network segmentation, really. We're just going back to the basics. The application that was being tested mid-pipeline didn't really need to be able to talk to Kubernetes or the cloud metadata layer. So some network filtering would have helped there, either through Kubernetes network policy or through AWS security groups or both. And again, least privilege on a whole bunch of steps here, um, mainly the fact that we had the ability to edit the configuration maps. That's what really lets us get admin over the whole cluster without having to do anything clever like break out of an, a pod to an underlying node. The one thing that RBAC would not be able to stop is the fact that we could modify the production image. And the reason for that is the pipeline was just doing what it had to do, right? So the pipeline's been built to modify an ECR image. So obviously, it has to modify an ECR image. Um, so in this case, it was actually not as bad as it could have been. The credentials that we compromised did only have one access to one image. That's good. Um, it's just a shame that we managed to get hold of it and then do our nasty things. And Victor has also been playing with web apps. Yeah, I had uh, also a similar case when I started off with the web application. So it was a WordPress application with some custom web pages, but I didn't really find uh, too much things there. But I will show you a video uh, what I have done. So <clears throat> here uh, in the video, we are just simulating uh, the web application. So I was looking around, uh, didn't really find anything. Uh, but I was uh, checking the sitemap file, and uh, especially maybe there is something in the folder as well. And what I found out that uh, there is more uh, in the sitemap uh, where the sitemap file was, because it was an S3 bucket. Uh, with directory listing enabled. So if it's not a DNS problem, then it's an S3 bucket problem. So in this case, we, we had that. And I found this file uh, called build.sh, uh, uh, which was um, responsible to push code to GitHub. But uh, we will see here in a second that um, this shell script uh, contained a hard-coded uh, credential. And uh, there was one another big problem with this, that the company also used this account as a shared account. So you could log into GitHub, but you could also use it for logging into Jenkins. 
And uh, basically, later I found out that this account was a service, used as a service account. So I logged into GitHub, get uh, read and write uh, access or permissions to multiple repositories. But also I, I could just you know, log into Jenkins and I uh, had administrator access. And once I found my mouse, So this account gave me access uh, to 14 clusters and more than 200 build servers or agents, and also more than 200 credentials. So starting from certificates to EC2, SSH case to AWS or other cloud uh, environments, also security scanners, and so on. So again, no shared credentials, no hard credit credentials, and uh, use least privilege principle with role-based ac access control. And uh, it's very important to have uh, auditing with monitoring and alerting enabled. And Ian, yeah, it's... So this one might actually be my favorite story that we're going to talk about today, because it had a customer using the wonderful line, you can't do that, it doesn't work which any pen testers in the room will know it's brilliant to hear, because generally we don't say we can do something unless we're fairly sure we actually can. So we had a customer who had some fairly strict rules about who's allowed to access production. In dev, anyone can do what they like. Log in as all the servers as root, we don't care. But in production, no access. Developers were not allowed any access. There were a couple of admin break glass accounts in a safe somewhere they were not meant to be used. And the customer was doing a fair few things fairly well. So for example, only the main branch would deploy to prod. The, the um, architecture here was that the repositories were all Terraform configuring cloud accounts. And uh, yeah, only the main branch could talk to prod, which was good. You had to have merge approval from a re relatively um, limited number of users to actually make any changes to the main branch. You had to have multiple users approve. So all, on the whole, this looks fairly good to start with. However, the customer was using Circle CI and uh, defining all of their tasks with um, YAML files. And I should say at this point, um, this was just a coincidence. It was Circle CI. These attacks work against all the platforms all the time. We're not picking on anyone. We, we attack them all equally. Um, configuration files were stored to say what every branch does, what every task does. But they were stored alongside the application code, which we had access to modify. Um, the customer said, oh, yeah, it's fine. We're using various secrets on various branches. So for example, if you're doing dev things, you're deving away quite happily, then you use the dev API keys to talk to the cloud. And that was on any uh, branch that has feature slash dev star. But if you want to push something to prod and you want to get through the, the approval process, then you do prod things and you use the prod API keys. I'm really hoping you can see where this is going because it's exactly where you think it is. Uh, we did hacky things. So we modified the YAML file, and we said for any branch, just run printm and use the prod API keys, because there was no protection stopping us doing that. Nothing had been configured. So this is when I, I said to the customer, hello, I, I think I can get your production API keys to modify your cloud. And they went, no, you can't. It doesn't work. How confident are you in that? Very confident. Do you mind if I try it? Yeah, go ahead. <laughs> Two redacted screenshots later, we were on an incident response call. Because this was the same for all of their dev teams across the entire organization and had been for about two years. They had no auditing on the credentials. They ran Terraform as admin, because why wouldn't you? So basically anyone who was a dev, despite being locked down, could get full production access to any of their cloud accounts. Uh, you can imagine the phone calls for that one were fairly exciting. <laughs> so once again, lessons learned here. Um, they're the same as they've been for quite a while now. Validate your secrets management and protection. This customer was really sure they were doing things right. Clearly, they hadn't actually sat down and said, right, so we just try and validate that. What happens if you try to use the prod keys? Um, assume to a certain extent that every developer is malicious and or compromised. Or trust your devs, but make sure you can log what they've been doing, especially in production accounts. So I think we all agree that at some point, we're all going to get popped by something. Probably a good idea to have some logs that tell you how and when you got popped. And especially with cloud keys, like if you've got cloud keys that are only meant to be used by your pipeline, and suddenly they're being used by some random IP out there on the internet, that should probably set off some alarm bells. 
and once again, least privilege are back. I know that running infrastructure as code tooling as non-admin is tricky. Phenon knows a nice way of making Terraform spit out the exact permissions it needs so you can craft policies. Please find me at the bar later, because I'd really like to know what you're using. But yeah, effectively, uh, least privilege are back. Log your credentials. I have a capability to rotate your credentials because this was the other part of the instant response was, so which credentials have been compromised? Don't know. Uh, how, how do we check that? Check your logs. We don't have any. Well, go and rotate them all. Uh, yeah, someone got some overtime out of that one, I think. Yeah, I had a similar case where uh, the environment was locked down and uh, they uh, only allowed three roles. There was uh, one read role, one build role, and an administrator role. So they were locked down, very well documented and separated. But there was uh, only a slight problem. They overlooked the permission and they forgot to remove uh, one little permission. And I will uh, show you what was the problem. So in this case, the problem was uh, related to the build role because uh, this role had enabled the build reply permission. Yes, so the, the build uh, role has, or the user had the, um, the build reply permission. And this build reply permission uh, will allow uh, once you already uh, build some pipelines and jobs, they will allow to reply it, but with uh, a small tricks that you can add your own Groovy code. So basically, you can just add your own Groovy code that uh, in this example you will see, I will get the content of the password file on a Linux machine. So even though they, they locked down, there was this small overlook that uh, allowed me uh, code execution. So here you can see the reply uh, button, and I will just copy and paste here a little groovy code. And we will see in the console output the content of the password file. Here we go. So, I mean, we could say, like, use least privilege with uh, role-based access control, but the company did. So what we can say is validate what you have, because uh, even a small overlook can have a very big impact. So... <clears throat> You have seen that uh, these examples didn't use any zero-day vulnerabilities, but they share uh, other common things, themes. Uh, and we will talk about these common themes and protections. Uh, Ian, would you like to talk about the secret management? Yeah, so we, we've seen some problems throughout pipelines where passwords are either shared across branches or hard-coded. Um, generally, we recommend some form of secrets management. Uh, it's fair to say that if an attacker has compromised your CI and you're using a programmatic um, secrets manager, they can probably interact anyway, but at the very least it means passwords shouldn't be showing up in logs, shouldn't be hard-coded and shared too widely around the estate, and also generally you should have some slightly better way of rotating your credentials. Um, plus, you've got logging to see where and when they've been used. Uh, as you have seen, even though there was some kind of segmentation, but it didn't really work because uh, we could access from a dev environment, a production environment as well. So they didn't really use any network segmentation or isolation. And it's very important to, uh, as you mentioned with the secrets, to limit the scope and the same with the network and uh, other builds as well. Monitoring and alerting as well. First of all, where are your credentials being used? Secondly, um, a lot of organizations seem to think, well, these are all 
These attacks are all through git commits, so I can just check them in the git logs. But if you see that, oh, someone did a git commit that caused a runner to spawn a shell, you still don't know what actually happened inside that shell, and quite often these environments are immutable, or not immutable, ephemeral, um, and the, the logs are gone once the environment's finished. So either a job can be deleted, or the logs might just never be stored at all. Um, having some form of monitoring and alerting to know what your pipeline's doing is probably a good idea for your, your blue team or your defenders to have access to. Even though in the examples we didn't talk about uh, the patch management or if any companies or, or the environments were behind uh, versions, but uh, for example in my cases where, where I uh, assessed Jenkins environments, uh, most of the time they were behind one or two versions or they used plugins that were vulnerable to some issues. So it's uh, very important to uh, have a regular uh, patch management and always uh, install the latest updates and use some hardening on the services. And I'm going to roll the last two into one here because I think a lot of the problems we see come from people writing up uh, CI pipelines because they want things to go fast and then not thinking about them anymore. So threat modeling and RBAC kind of fall into the same camp. If you're implementing CI pipelines, if you have them in your organizations at the moment, and if you've not thought about this before, have a sit down and do a tabletop exercise and say, right, what would happen if we had a rogue developer or if we've got open source projects that we use or we maintain? and they run some form of open source, um, anyone on the internet can make a commit sort of pipeline. Just sitting down and thinking what would the impact be, what's the blast radius, probably will at the very least let you understand the risk you're facing and then start to think about how you're going to either stop them or detect if an attacker is doing something dodgy. So to summarize uh, what we have talked about, CICD is beneficial for the companies and for the developers because they help with their uh, jobs to automate it, but they can be also very complex and uh, even a small oversight or overlook uh, can have a very big impact as we have seen. Um, none of these problems are new or used, we didn't use any zero days. And also, as Ian mentioned in the previous slides, uh, these environments uh, doesn't really have uh, a threat model that could show uh, any problems. And they also, uh, unfortunately, have uh, the companies gave very little focus on the pipeline and the supporting infrastructure. And, and the, the kind of little focus thing is maybe less true now than it was when we started writing these slides. Obviously, over the last few years, there have been uh, quite a lot of high-profile CI compromises, things like CodeCov. Um, also, in the last few months, this has got more and more of a hot topic. One of the things I wanted to give an honorable mention to but couldn't work out how to fit it into the stories was um, dependency signing or uh, artifact signing. A lot of people seem to think, well, I sign everything at the end of my pipeline, so I'm secure, right? And they're, they're kind of correct in that if you run a signing task at the end of your pipeline and then I run your, your artifacts, if you give me a, an exe or a .jar or whatever and it's signed, I know that it's definitely the one you built. But if an attacker's compromised your pipeline before that stage, congratulations, you've programmatically signed my malware, and now everyone's gonna trust it even more. Again, don't get me wrong, signing is solving a huge problem, but it's absolutely not a silver bullet for security. We have used up all of our time, so I suspect we're gonna get kicked out of here in about 54 seconds, according to the big ticking clock there. Uh, we have a room for another half hour if you want to, if you've got any questions. Um, either, feel free to reach out. We are uh, Smarticus and Wukpi, how do you pronounce Wuspi. it? Wuspi. Wuspi, <laughs> um, on Twitter. Um, we're also first.last at nccgroup.com or find us around here at some point. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you.